All right. Well, good evening. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Guion Foreman, president of the police board, and I am calling the board's July 21st public meeting to order. To protect the public's health in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is taking place remotely. Pursuant to the Illinois Open Meetings Act, I have determined that holding this meeting in person is not practical or prudent. The city of Chicago remains subject to the governor's disaster proclamation due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and the disease continues to be a threat, especially to the unvaccinated and people with certain health conditions. We are therefore having this meeting remotely this month. The meeting is open to the public via video and audio conference and is being carried live by CAN TV. Members of the public are on mute in order to reduce background noise and disruptions. We have a court reporter making a transcript of this meeting. In addition to police board members, we have several city officials here with us this evening. I will begin by taking attendance so it is clear who else is participating in this meeting. Please say here after I read your name. Police board vice president Paula Wolf. Here. Board member Stephen Block. Here. Board member Morale Cusack. Here. Board member Nanette Dorley. Here. Board member Michael Eady. Here. Board member Steve Flores. Here. Board member Andrea Zop. Here. Superintendent of Police David Brown. Here. Chief Administrator of the Civilian Office of Police Accountability Andrea Kirsten. Here. Inspector General of Chicago Police Department. Uh, of Ch City of Chicago, Deborah Witzberg. Here. Deputy Chief of Chicago Police Department's Bureau of Internal Affairs, Tracy Walker. Here. First Deputy Superintendent, Eric Carter. Here. Chief of the Chicago Police Department's Bureau of Patrol, Brian McDermott. Here. <clears throat> Chief of Chicago Police Department's Bureau of, I don't have the bureau, Dinahan. Bureau of Detectives. Detectives, all right, thank you. General Counsel to the Superintendent, Dana O'Malley. Here. Executive Director of Police Board, Max Caproni. Here. And joining us for the first time is the new Deputy Mayor for Public Safety, Elena Gottrich. We'll begin this uh, evening's meeting by recognizing a board member who's attending their last final police board meeting, Steve Flores. Steve joined the board in 2016. He's a law partner. He's a partner with the law firm of Winston and Strawn, and he's been a recognized leader in his field and was recently recognized uh, Lawyer of the Year by the Hispanic Lawyers Association of Illinois. Steve has been a tremendous colleague and an invaluable member of the police board, and we will all miss very much working with you. Steve, not only have you been a, a great member of the police board, but also become a really good friend. Uh, you know, I know this is a, a really challenging job, and uh, as obvious, you know, you had hair when we started this, uh, <laughs> this process together, and man, really grateful for your service to the city of Chicago. I know this isn't always an easy job, uh, certainly time away from your, your job and time away from your family. And we really are appreciative for, for all of your efforts, man, and really want to commend you. So bravo, and thank you so much. Thank you, President Foreman. If I could just say a, a few quick thank yous. Please. So yeah, almost six years, my term is, is over before the next public meeting. So I just want to thank all the board members, you, President Foreman, uh, Vice President Wolf, our Executive Director, Max Caproni, Jasmine Rollins, and of course, our hearing officers, you know, as you mentioned, it's not easy work, but I know everyone here is committed to doing the very best, you know, with in independence and integrity. Um, also, obviously, Chief Administrator Kirsten, all the staff at COPA, Superintendent Brown, and all the dedicated members of the Chicago Police Department. And of course, last but not least, all the members of the public who diligently call in month in and month out, you know, for years that I've been on the board you know, fighting for justice, fighting for their neighborhoods, fighting for our great city. You know, I thank you all. I commend you. Um, and, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> we will now proceed to the items on the meeting agenda. 
we will have time at the end of the meeting for public comments. Once again, members of the public are currently on mute in order to reduce background noise and disruptions. When we get to the public comment portion of the meeting, we will unmute each speaker. We're pleased to have with us this evening, Deborah Witzberg, Inspector General for the City of Chicago, who will be speaking on her office's public information portal and other initiatives. Deborah. Hello, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I wanna talk a bit about uh, the resources and reference materials that are available on OIG's website, on the, the, the website of the Office of Inspector General. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, Dion, if that's okay. Yes, that's fine. Okay. Do you have the, okay, there we go. Perfect. Yes, can you, yes. can everybody see this? Okay. Um, and I should, uh, sorry, just very quickly by way of a, a quick introduction. I, I am Deborah Witzberg. I'm Inspector General for the City of Chicago as of the, the end of April. Before that, I served uh, until the end of last year as the city's Deputy Inspector General for Public Safety. And so in that capacity, I've, I've had the pleasure of attending many of these meetings and I, um, I appreciate the invitation to come back this evening. Um, we're going to start here at, at our website, the website of the Office of Inspector General is at www.igchicago.org. And we're going to start from here so that I can show you all where to find the resources that we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about this evening. So the first thing is, is a resource that's perhaps most relevant to the proceedings of the police board. And that is a reference guide on the disciplinary process for members of the Chicago Police Department. So starting here from our website, which I would encourage everyone to just as a general matter, read you know, in depth because of its compelling content. But um, specifically, I will direct attention here. We go to our office and then to the public safety section of the website. And, and this is where you will find information about the work, our police oversight and accountability work. Among the options that you can choose here is what's called the CPD disciplinary process overview. And this is, as I say, intended as kind of a living reference document to um, provide some insight into the extremely complicated system and process by which members of the Chicago Police Department are investigated and disciplined for allegations of misconduct. Um, and this is set up to, to provide some of that reference information in a number of different ways. We have some, some information on the website about the system as an overview. There's a brief video on how to use the, the website materials. And then kind of the meat of the work is, is here in a series of interactive flowcharts. The pathway by which a member of the Chicago Police Department might be disciplined is dependent upon both the rank of the member accused of misconduct and the nature of the discipline that's recommended for a sustained allegation of misconduct. And so these provide the opportunity to select both by rank and by discipline, um, one of those pathways to explore how discipline might work going from a complaint through to implemented discipline. So we'll, we'll just look, for example, here at a police officer, um, somebody at the rank of police officer who, uh, for whom a suspension has been, um, has been determined. So we click on that option um, and this is a flow chart, you know, which I will say certainly looks very complex in its appearance, and that that is a that, that that's part of the exercise here is to accurately capture how very complex this this process and system are. And so we see here you can follow this process through from complaint or notification on its various um, sort of various pathways to a final resolution. Um, these flowcharts are linked to each other. So uh, when, when one flowchart gets to where another ends, where another one would begin, those are linked in these electronic versions. They're also available in, in printable PDF form. Um, so, you know, this is intended as a resource both for members of the public and frankly for members of the department as an aid in kind of navigating this system and, and getting some transparency into it. Um, the other pieces that I want to talk a bit about uh, are located on our information portal, and these are data dashboards. So again, we'll go back to the, the main landing of the website, and here we will go to information portal. Um, 
the information portal contains these dashboards, these, these visualizations of many kinds of city data, not all of them police related. We're going to talk about the police related ones, but um, just for awareness, there, there are you know, others, including city finances, OIG's own operations, city employees, and so on. So we're going to go to the, the public safety dashboards. These are data visualizations powered by OIG's direct back end access to city and in this case, police department data of various kinds. And so these are automatically updated um, and 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 um, sort of channeled directly from directly from various city sources. So we won't go through all of these, but I, I want to show you a number of these examples and then talk about the kinds of conclusions that can be drawn from the data that's available here. And I should say all of this, including the flowcharts, all of this work is done as part of OIG's transparency imperative um, to make information about the way city government runs more available and transparent and, and open to public view. So we're going to start here with information on arrests made by CPD. And so we do that by clicking here on the arrest dashboard. And there are various kind of dimensions of this data which can be examined here. All of those different, different kinds of categories of information are, are here in different tabs. And this data can be manipulated and filtered depending on what a user might be interested in here. So you can see on this tab having to do with the demographics of CPD arrests, you can do things like look at the race of both the arresting officer and the subject of an arrest and so on. Um, we also, wherever possible, we include mapping exercises in our dashboards. And that is in large part an equity exercise. There are um, and geography and equity are, are very closely tied in the city of Chicago. And so whenever data is susceptible to mapping, we, we make an effort to do that. Um, so some key takeaways on arrest data, and, and this is with respect to 2021 data. Um, and on all of these are conclusions that can be drawn here from our data just by way of example. So beginning in March of 2020, CPD arrests dropped sharply and, and continued um, to drop throughout 2021. We see certain seasonal patterns in arrests, which have, um, which did not persist in 2021. That drop in arrests was accompanied by kind of a break in those, in those seasonal patterns. In 2021, and we can see this on this map here, the 11th district had the most arrests, both in terms of absolute numbers and per capita in terms of population. We'll go then um, to the dashboards dealing with complaints and notifications. So these are the disciplinary histories of CPD members. This is an area which is, which is undergoing the most work and development internally here at OIG with respect to our dashboards. The currently available public information on disciplinary histories of CPD members includes only those complaints which were initiated before February of 2019. And that has to do with the change at that time in, in the case management system being used for CPD disciplinary investigations. Updated information um, and, and the, avail the public availability on the dashboards is underway here. I, I, and I look forward to having updates about that soon. In the meantime, there is this information available. This is updated on a continuing basis for those investigations which were initiated before February of 2019. A couple of conclusions or sort of takeaways here. Um, investigations back as far as 2007 remain pending closure. Um, and hundreds of investigations opened in 2018 alone uh, remain, remain open and pending closure. Uh, we're going to go to an investigatory stop dashboard here. Um, an investigatory stop report is, an, is a report completed by a CPD member when they complete certain kinds of brief detentions of members of the public. Um, and we see we have Trend, uh, trend information here, as well as census demographics, mapping exercises, information on evidence that might be recovered in those investigatory stops and so on. So some, um, some takeaways here, um, black subjects of investigatory stops are the only racial or ethnic group overrepresented among investigatory stops as compared to their proportion of Chicago's population. Um, as you can see here on this trend line, total investigatory stops dropped dramatically in March of 2020 and have remained relatively low since then. That drop in, in frequency and in number of investigatory stops 
uh, did not correspond to any change in the demographic distribution, which is to say, even in that smaller number, that lower number of, of investigatory stops, the demographic patterns that, that we saw persisted. Um, we'll go here uh, to a dashboard on tactical response reports. A tactical response report is a document used by CPD members to record um, either an injury to a member, but but primarily the use of force by a CPD member. We have a number of different, again, um, kind of filterable and, and visualized data collections here. Apologies for the, the buffering. A couple of takeaways available in the tactical response report data. Um, from 2015 to 2020, CPD reported progressively fewer use of force incidents over the course of that time. So a drop from over 3,700 incidents reported in 2015 to about 1,700 incidents in 2021. Um, during that same time period from 2015 through 2021, um, and, and one of the things you can filter here, I'll just interrupt briefly to say, is that time period. So there's this drop down list and you can you can select for different periods of time by which to filter this data. So over the entire period of time from 2015 to 2021, we see from the data that that subjects identified as black were overwhelmingly the subjects of, of CPD uses of force. Um, and then finally, I want to take a look at the dashboard information on sworn members of CPD. And this is kind of you know, the question of what the, the, the members of the department look like as a population. Um, that is filterable, again, by certain categories and, and date ranges, as well as operational divisions of the department and, and some mapping data. Key takeaways here are that the number of CPD members, so we're showing the current member count at 11,628 uh, sworn members, I should say, um, taken from the city's data. The number of th that number of sworn members has decreased each year from 2019 through 2021, and the percentage of that decrease has gone up in each successive year. Um, because of a combination of factors, including hiring class composition and retirements, CPD's population of Hispanic sworn members has been growing steadily, while the population of Black members has been in slight decline. Um, and finally, we, we can see from the data and it's it's information on length of service that from 2018 to 2021, the number of sworn members with 20 or more years of service has gone up in, in both absolute and percentage terms, even while the total number of officers declined. And so that is to say that even while the department is getting smaller on the whole, uh, it is aging toward retirement. Um, and so I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop sharing there um, with those, with that kind of overview and, and those examples of the kinds of conclusions that can be drawn from this data. And I would encourage um, folks to take a look at the dashboards and to use them really, you know, to answer whatever questions are of particular interest. And again, I'm not, I don't know how exactly you want to do this, but I'd be happy to answer any questions now if there are any of those or or to hold to hold on questions until later. Yeah. So so first of all, thank you very much. I think that you know you you, you made something kind of complex relatively easy. I, I've used uh, the dashboard before, and I definitely find it valuable. And I would strongly encourage others to you know go take a look, go drive around uh, the, the the site, and and you know try to get some of the information that you're seeking. Um, we certainly have done it uh, from a police board perspective. Um, so I guess my big question is is okay. I have this information now. What I think that really depends on on sort of what what you need the information for and and where you sit on sort of the stakeholder landscape here in Chicago. Our intention here really is that you know we are all well served by elevating public policy conversations with clear and reliable and shared data that we can all have more productive conversations if we're sort of playing with the same deck of information. And so these dashboards are not offered, you know, with specific recommendations or or anything like that, but really rather as a transparency exercise. And so now what I think very much depends on, on sort of what you need it for and, and where you sit on the landscape. Okay. Other board members, superintendent, any other questions? Okay. I will also, I'm sorry, if I could just very quickly add that each of those dashboards that we looked at, and apologies, I should have pointed this out when we had them up, each of those dashboards includes a feedback mechanism. And so if okay. in using those dashboards, which I hope you all will, you have either feedback, ways you think that we could improve them, or questions about either their use or their content 
um, please send those our way, either through that feedback mechanism that's built in or, or just by reaching out to us. We, we will be very happy to hear from you and to answer any questions we can. Thank you very much. Um, again, I, I'm a consumer of it. I think it's good data that's out there. Um, it certainly helps me ask some specific questions. Superintendent, I have some questions coming your way, some things I just looked up recently. It uh, looks like, Paula, you had a question? Yeah, just quickly, a follow-up on your last comment. Are the questions that are submitted also transparent and public, and are your answers to those questions transparent and public? That's a good question. I believe there are frequently asked questions, but I will check. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I know this isn't the last that we'll hear from you in the IG's office. So we look forward to uh, to, to our continued dialogue and thank you all so much for the work that you do. Thank you very much, Dion. And Paula, very quickly, there are in fact frequently asked questions listed on the website and their answers. Yeah, I, I was asking a more specific question. Maybe anonymously are the questions that are asked posted and then your answers to those questions posted. The questions about the content of the dashboards, no, not specifically. Questions about their use and, and how, how they are designed. Yes, those are, those are listed there. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> board members, <clears throat> is there a motion to approve the minutes of the boards June 16th, regular public meeting. So moved, Paula Wolf. Second, Mike Oedi. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Our next regular public meeting will be held. Um, give me one second. Our next regular public meeting will be held. Thursday, August 18th at 7.30 p.m. Whether this will be an in-person meeting or a remote meeting will be determined closer to the meeting date. The police board meets in executive session to consider personnel matters and litigation. Those discussions are closed to the public as authorized by sections 2C1, 3, 4, and 11 of the Illinois Open Meetings Act. A summary of items discussed in the executive sessions is posted in the meetings of the minutes on our website. Is there a motion to close those sessions as authorized by the Open Meetings Act? Paul Wolf, so moved. Mike Weedy, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. We have several disciplinary cases on the agenda this evening. The police board, as authorized by the Open Meetings Act, has considered <clears throat> in a closed meeting two police disciplinary cases. The board will now take final action on these cases. Regarding case number 21PB2997, is there a motion to find police officers Mark Jiraki and Michael Kelly guilty of failing to promptly report that a gun was taken during an off duty altercation? not guilty of all other charges and to suspend each officer without pay for 30 days. Paul oh, Wolf, so moved. Michael Weedy, second. I will now call on board members for their votes. Wolf? Aye. Block? Aye. Cusack? Aye. Edie? Aye. Flores? Aye. Zop? Aye. <laughs> And I agree with the majority's findings on guilt, but I vote to impose a longer suspension. Voting in favor are board members, Wolf, Block, Cusack, Edie, Flores, and Zop. I vote against the motion. The motion passes by a vote of six to one. Is there a motion to adopt the written findings and decision and dissent that have been reviewed by all board members who participated in the case? We love you even if you dissent. This is Paula Wolf. I will move that motion. Any second? Yes, second. Michael E. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Regarding case number 21PB2988, is there a motion to find police officer Reginald Murray not guilty of all charges related to an off-duty domestic incident and to reinstate him to his position with the CPD. Paula Wolf, so moved. Michael Weedy, second. I will now call on members of the board for their votes. 
Aye. Block? Aye. Cusack? Aye. Edie? Aye. Flores? Aye. Zop? Aye. And I vote in favor of the motion. Voting in favor are board members Wolf, Block, Cusack, Edie, Flores, Zop, and myself. The motion passes by a vote of seven to zero. Is there a motion to adopt the written findings and decision that have been reviewed by all board members who participated in the case? So moved, Paula Wolf. Second, Michael Weedy. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. The written decisions in the cases on which the board took final action this evening will be entered as of today's date, sent to the parties, and then posted on the board's website. There are also two announcements of disciplinary rulings on the agenda tonight. Board members Block and Cusack will make these uh, announcements. Shall I go first? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I was randomly selected from the police board's membership to consider one matter in which Chief Administrator of the Civilian Office of Police Accountability and the superintendent of police did not agree regarding the discipline of a police officer. In request for review number 22-13, the chief administrator recommended that police officer Noble Williams be discharged from the CPD for firing his weapon while off duty at an alleged burglar in violation of the CPD general order on the use of force. The superintendent disagreed with the chief administrator's finding on the use of force allegation and recommended a reprimand for other rule violations. After considering this matter, it is my opinion that the superintendent did not meet the burden of overcoming the chief administrator's recommendation for discipline. And the recommendation will therefore be deemed accepted by the superintendent. A copy of the written opinion will be posted on the board's website as required by the municipal code. Thank you. Board member Block. I was randomly selected from the police board's membership to consider one matter on which the chief administrator of the civilian office of police accountability and the superintendent of police did not agree regarding the discipline of two police officers. In request for review numbers 22-07 and 22-08, the chief administrator recommended sustaining allegations against police officers Evan Solano and Sammy Encarnacion arising out of the fatal police-involved shooting of Anthony Alvarez on March 31st, 2021, including that officer Solano discharged his firearm at Mr. Alvarez in violation of the Chicago Police Department general order on use of force. The chief administrator recommended that officer Solano be discharged from CPD and that officer Encarnacion be given a substantial suspension up to and including discharge. The superintendent disagreed with the chief administrator's recommendations. The superintendent found that the evidence was legally insufficient to sustain several allegations including that Officer Solano used deadly force in violation of the general order. The superintendent agreed with the sustained findings for other allegations and recommended that Officers Solano and Encarnacion each be suspended for 20 days. After thoroughly considering this matter and reviewing multiple items from the investigation file, including body-worn camera videos, surveillance videos, CPD's foot pursuit training bulletin in effect at the time of the incident and Officer Solano's and Officer Encarnacion's statements to COPA, it is my opinion that the superintendent met the burden of overcoming the chief administrator's recommendations for discipline of both Officers Solano and Encarnacion. Though Mr. Alvarez's death is undeniably tragic, Officer Solano and Officer Encarnacion's decisions and actions on March 31st, 2001 were objectively reasonable based on the totality of the circumstances as the officers reasonably perceived them. The respondent's response shall therefore be implemented. A copy of the written opinion that sets forth in detail the basis for this decision will be posted on the board's website as required by the municipal code. Thank you. 
<clears throat> the board also considers appeals by applicants for Chicago police officer position who have been removed from the eligibility list due to the results of a background examination. There are several appeals on the agenda this evening. <clears throat> the police board as authorized by the Open Meetings Act has considered in a closed meeting three appeals from applicants for Chicago police officer position who have been removed from the eligibility list due to the results of a background exam. The board will now take final action on these appeals. Regarding appeals number 22, AA, 01, 02, and 03, is there a motion to adopt the appeals officer's findings, conclusions, and recommendations? So moved, Paula Wolf. Second, Michael Eady. <clears throat> I will now call on members of the board for their votes. Wolf? Aye. Block? Aye. Cusack? Aye. Dorley? Dorley? Aye. <clears throat> Aye. 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 Flores? Aye. Zop? Yes. And I vote in favor of the motion. Voting in favor are board members Wolf, Block, Cusack, Dorley, Edie, Flores, Zop, and myself. The motion passes by a vote of eight to zero. The written findings and decision, each of the appeals on which the board took final action this evening will be entered as of today's date, sent to the parties, and posted on the board's website within five business days. Next up, Superintendent Brown, if you would like to provide your report. Good evening to the police board and to all the community members joining us today. I want to take, I want to start out by acknowledging the men and women of the Chicago Police Department. They do one of the toughest jobs day in and day out in service to the city and its residents. Over the last month, we lost two officers and one of our sergeants uh, to suicide. Department is heartbroken, but we are committed to making sure no officer feels they have to struggle in silence. On the job, no day is the same, and, and it can be a lot to process. Along with the pressures of a dangerous profession, police officers deal with the ups and downs of everyday life, like all of us. That's why the department has support and resources in place for officers whenever they need them, seven days a week. 24 hours a day. Uh, we offer free counseling and have licensed clinicians on staff and a standalone location for counseling service to maintain confidentiality. The department currently has a temporary location on the south side, and we are working to finalize a permanent location on both the south and north sides, close to where our officers live in the city. We have peer support leaders as well as substance and alcohol use counselors and the employee assistance program also called EAP provides emergency assistance 24 seven. When police officers are at their best, our city and our neighborhoods are made better. Officers have been hard at work in our community and due to their bravery and their courage and dedication and commitment to the city. This year so far, uh, month to date, July, 2022 versus July 2021, homicides are down 45% and shootings are down 32%. I'll say that one more time. Month to date, that's July 2022 versus July 2021, homicides are down 45% and shootings are down 32%. Citywide, year to date, January to July versus January to, to July 2022, homicides are down 15% and shootings are down 19% in that year to date citywide comparison, January to July. Our consent decree compliance for the Chicago Police Department has significantly improved from just 11% in 2020 to 72%, with even more improvement needed and expected. We're also making, we've also made more than 3,200 gun arrests and over 700 carjacking related arrests. We continue to work really hard to hold offenders accountable, but we know this is only one part of public safety. 
That's why the Chicago Police Department is focused on and committed to community engagement. Making our city safer is all about collaboration. Officers are out in the neighborhoods building relationships and working to grow trust. Our youth programming has kicked off for this summer. Our officers are mentoring young people uh, in different neighborhoods across the city. Activities spanning the arts, chess, and several sports, including baseball, boxing, and basketball, are sponsored by the police department. Investing time in our young people is one of the more important investments we can make. In addition, we understand the importance of addressing the root causes of violence. So we continue to work closely with the Community Safety Coordination Center, other city departments and agencies, and our community partners to seek alternatives to the criminal justice system when possible. The Chicago Police Department is dedicated to making this city safer for all of us. And our officers will never stop working to realize that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, Chief Administrator Kirsten, if you would like to provide your report. I would. Thank you, President Foreman. Today's ruling in the fatal shooting of Anthony Alvarez is a profound moment for all residents of the city of Chicago, including members of the police department and particularly those members that were involved in this incident. But of course, no one is more impacted than the Alvarez family who are still grieving their loss. Regardless of anyone's feelings or opinions on this case, COPA's recommendations or today's outcome, it's important to remember that a family is yet again impacted by this moment. The Chicago Police Board has announced that the one member opinion regarding the fatal police shooting of Anthony Alvarez was decided in favor of the superintendent of the department, finding no fault in the use of deadly force by shooting officer Evan Solano and upholding a mere 20 day suspension for operational violations. To be clear, the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, my agency, which investigates all officer involved shootings, recommended sustained allegations against Officer Solano and also recommended that he be separated or terminated from the department. COPA's sustained allegations were for failure to activate body-worn camera properly, failure to properly load firearm, uh, discharging a firearm in the direction of Anthony Alvarez in violation of general orders, as well as acting inconsistently with training bulletins around the foot pursuits. Anthony Alvarez was shot and killed as he was running and facing away from police officers. Police officers who began pursuing him before calling for backup or notifying anyone of their pursuit. Police officers who were attempting to stop Mr. Alvarez for a prior traffic offense. Police officers who COPA found failed to take meaningful and appropriate de-escalation steps and acted inconsistently with their training. Yes, Anthony Alvarez was armed with a gun, but department policy does not permit officers to use deadly force on a subject who flees with a firearm, absent an imminent threat, which COPA found Mr. Alvarez did not pose. We do recognize the incredibly difficult circumstances officers face on a daily basis. But COPA believes that an officer's adherence to department rules and training is essential to ensuring officer and public safety. Critical principles of police reform, such as prioritizing the sanctity of life and requiring de-escalation tactics, must be more than hollow words in a policy or a general order. We've been told this time and time again through the Department of Justice report, our consent decree, and the many lives impacted by these issues. These principles must be the standard that all officers are held to when they decide to use deadly force. Permeated deviation from these principles undermines the department's efforts to build public trust in policing. Despite today's outcome, COPA stands by its thorough investigation, its analysis, and findings. COPA considered the totality of the circumstances facing the officers in this case and applied department rules, policy, and training instructions by which all members of the department are required to abide. COPA has and will continue to evaluate and recommend changes to the department's foot pursuit policy to increase the safety of both the public and police officers going forward. In our city, and because of the long history of, of distrust in our systems of government, every incident that results in the death of someone at the hands of law enforcement should result in a full evidentiary hearing. This is not about winning or losing, but about facts, evidence, and testimony 
being presented to the full police board before a final decision is determined. We respect the process, but strongly disagree with the final decision put forth by the one member review. We believe this case was deserving of a full evidentiary hearing before the entire board and a review of the rules governing our non-concurrence process is warranted. Impacted parties and the residents of the city of Chicago deserve to have all the facts and evidence presented in a full public and transparent hearing, not just for Anthony Alvarez's case, but for all fatal police shootings. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I would also like to strongly encourage everyone, members of the media, members of the public, to read a, a really well-written uh, opinion in the case. It'll be written, it'll be on our website, and you have the opportunity to go read that. Um, Chief, uh, you know, I respect your, your decision to, to uphold, um, but with our processes, and I think it was a very thorough process, so I would strongly encourage everyone to take a look at the opinion. I would now call upon members of the public who signed up in advance to speak to make sure that we have time to hear from all speakers. There's a two minute time limit on comments. Our first speaker is Jacques Stefanik. Thank you, President Foreman, and thank you, members of the police board and um, all members here. Uh, my name is Jacques Stefanik. I am a member of the Chicago Youth Council for Police Accountability, and I will be representing the council and providing a report of our activities. <clears throat> Within the past couple of weeks, uh, members of the council have been meeting with officers and high-ranking officials in the police department to schedule for at public safety headquarters and eventually schedule a following tour at the Chicago Police Academy in order to build a better bridge between the youth members of the city of Chicago um, and the Chicago Police Department to have more dialogue when issues and um, incidents happen to our youth community. Um, and we do, in, um, and even members of the general public to even um, come over to the event. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to members of the uh, Besides that, that is everything that we have. Jacques, you broke up a little bit. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming you, that you said that we can contact you if there was any additional questions. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Um, you, if you have any additional questions, you can feel free to reach out to me, myself, or other members of the Chicago Youth Council for Police Accountability. All right, thank you very much. Our next speaker, Sherry Bowling. Hello, yes, uh, my name is Sherry Bowling, and I live in the fourth district in the Avalon Park community, and I just have a few concerns. My first concern is we heard about uh, I'm sorry, my first concern is that we heard about coffee with the commander and we were just wondering where will we have that opportunity to meet our commander and have coffee with him. And my second point is the blocks between 83rd and Dorchester to 83rd of Woodlawn have had excessive speeding problems and hundreds of accidents down through the years. Last year, we had two fatalities. One of the fatalities was my neighbor nephew. Another neighbor spoke of how hard it was to hold this young man in his arms as he was dying. A few weeks later, another fatality in this area that neighbor had to come out their door to see a young man dead on their fr front lawn from a bad car accident. We have had numerous accidents on our corner on 83rd and Kenwood. We've even had a school bus run into our home. When we told our Artemis officers about the fatalities, all they said to us was, oh, we're sorry to hear that. We have been repeatedly denied a stop sign or speed camera. It's so difficult to keep watching accident after accident with people getting hurt or killed with no help in sight. This is a residential area where seniors and children walk up and down the street. They should be able to do this without concerns about being hit by a car. Within the past three weeks, we've had two more accidents in which one was the accident was with an elderly couple who was taken to the hospital. The second accident was by Avalon Park where children were going to day camp. The lives of our seniors and children are at stake. We are, help we are asking for your help in getting speeding under control in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent, is there someone that we can, uh, from CPD, that we can get in touch with CDOT, uh, as well as there's a, a, an effort called Vision Zero. Um, uh, Sherry, in high school, I, I lived on 83rd in Dorchester. So I've witnessed many accidents on that block, on that corner, my whole life. And so, so I know that that's the case. So Superintendent, can I um, 
to follow up with you and, and, sure. and Max, and we can identify someone from CPD that yes. we can get in touch with CDOT and Vision Zero. Yeah, Chief, Chief of Patrol Brian McDermott's on this call, so just give me a call and we'll, through Chief McDermott, Chief of Patrol, we'll get that connection made. Okay. And also the coffee with the commander connection as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, next speaker, Lakeisha Caples. Lakeisha Caples, if you can press star six to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I'll try to be very brief. Um, I just wanted to share my experience and challenges, um, not just with my case, but with other victims of sexual violence who have reported to the police and have not received um, any assistance or very little assistance or was even turned away and not even allowed to report um, sexual violence. And specifically, I'm referring to both on and offline sexual violence that many agencies refer to as cyber sexual violence. And this type of sexual violence, which is unfortunately a new trend in our society, operates both online and offline. And offline, a lot of the perpetrators uh, are inciting other participants, third-party participants, to participate in a campaign of stalking and harassment. And the motivation for this is to silence the victim and prevent them from reporting and holding, uh, reporting the perpetrator and holding them accountable. I've spoke before and I've um, shared my story about how I went to um, the police, CPD, and tried to report the, my case to a detective who then refused to, um, to assist me and told me that it was my fault. I've since filed a complaint against um, Detective Mona Majid and have spoken out against um, the refusal to hold sexual predators accountable um, and not just the actual predator, but those who are incited and solicited to participate online. And I, have, I did receive a response from the last uh, meeting, but there still has not been uh, movement in my case. Ms. Ms. Caples, I I'm sorry. I'm sorry to, to interrupt. Your time is up. Um, I remember you calling in before. Um, uh, Ephraim uh, or, or Chief, is this, is, can we have someone follow up? She says she's made a complaint. Uh, yes, this is Andrea Kirsten from COPA. We can have someone follow up. It's likely going to be a matter under BIA jurisdiction because as I understand her complaint, it's not against an officer for sexual misconduct by an officer, but for some sort of failure to render appropriate police response to her complaint of sexual misconduct. So uh, okay. we can we can talk with BIA, but my guess is that's a case that's with uh, their department. Okay, so superintendent, I can have Max follow someone from right. your team. Yeah, and, Deputy um, Chief Tracy Walker is on this call as well as Chief Dinahan, Bureau of Detectives, to follow up on the actual case as well. Okay, so so um, Ms. Cables, we can we can have someone uh, ensure to follow up and get you in contact with the appropriate people. <laughs> our next Thank speaker, you. our next speaker is Brandy Washington. Brandy Washington, if you can press star six. All right, I will come back, Ms. Washington. I can see that you're here. Uh, I'll come back to you. Our next speaker, Jennifer Edwards. Ms. Edwards, if you Good can- Good evening. Can yeah. You can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me now? Good evening. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Um, I have just a little bit tonight. Um, I want to say hello to everyone. 
Um, just wanted to mention that some of the work that we do is um, our goals are to help the community members in our neighborhoods speak up about crime issues that need attention effectively and encourage them to help state them to the police department and other city agencies. We also want to promote um, collaboratory work uh, between the, dis the, the districts that border each other, uh, such as three, six, four, seven, and five. We're in three and six now. Um, Superintendent Brown, I'm bringing this to you because you asked me to bring uh, some things to you at the barbecue if so something was happening. Uh, I have some um, questions tonight about the DCO officers. I want to speak out and say that they are very good officers. We're very fond of them. We know most of them in the third and the sixth districts by name. They're very personable. Uh, they communicate uh, effectively with community members. But my questions are, um, what are their duties? Are they different than CAPS officers, the beat officers? Um, can they make arrests? Can they write tickets? Um, also their work schedule. We've got a lot of crime that happens when it gets dark. Most of the officers work nine to five, okay? It would be very helpful and it might not be, they might not like this, but if they could work a little bit later, uh, we're not saying midnights, or if you could go to like a rotating schedule for them. Um, we also want to support uh, officers getting days off. We know that there's a crunch uh, the report earlier said that, you know, we don't have a lot of officers. We have um, Ms. tried Ms. to help Edwards. with recruiting. I'm sorry, Ms. Edwards. I'm sorry, your time is up. Okay. Yeah, I really like all the points she made. Uh, those DCO officers can do it all. They can make arrests. Uh, they're working off a problem-solving model, and that's really been the positive response we've receive from the community that they really do work to solve problems and not just make arrests or write citations. So we can flex their schedules. That's been a, a topic of conversation to, to have them work later. And so you're on point with all of those suggestions. I'm gonna recommend that Chief of Patrol Brian McDermott get in contact with you to further discuss this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brandy Washington, you've been able to unmute. All right, we will go to the next speaker then. Uh, Elise Edwards. Lisa Davis. Good, good evening, everyone. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak. I am from the Avalon community area. I've heard someone else on as well. And I am from the Stony Island Park neighborhood area. So we're right across the street east of Stony Island. I'm also calling about the speeding, racing, and the driving here on Stony as well as through my neighborhood. I'm, I'm around 1700 East 85th Street and around an elementary school. We have a large number of elderly people as well as children going to the school. And you, at times you hear racing down these streets. So this impacts everyone going to work, going to get grocery, et cetera. So I wanted to see if someone can follow up with me in terms of what we can do for this in general, it sounds like for all of Avalon. Um, next point I had, and someone mentioned this as well, is about the engagement with our commander, our new commander, commander in the 4th District. Um, we want to have the dates that are available for the coffee with the commander for sectors 10 and 20. And I just wanted to see if someone can follow up with me on, those, on, on that point as well. Um. Yeah, so yes, uh, same superintendent, if we can, we can make sure that we get you contact information if someone yep. can get in contact. We will. Thanks. Our next speaker, Lisa, uh, well, I don't know if that was Elise Edwards or if that was Lisa Davis. It was Lisa Davis. 
Okay, thank you very much. Next speaker, Jackie Carey. Jackie Carey, if you can press star six to unmute. Next speaker, Charlene Beasley. This is Jacqueline Carey, I just unmuted. All right, thank you. Hello, no problem. Good evening, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Jacqueline Carey. I'm a home a homeowner in Meredith neighborhood in Chicago. For the last five years, we have been um, terrorized and bullied by a group of people living at 8558 South Dante Avenue. We've had shootings, game bangers, very loud music, and flash mobs from at least like 60 to 70 people hanging around the block. They're very disruptive and dangerous and disrespectful to the, to the community. More importantly, about two years ago, I was carjacked by two individuals that were hanging out at the house. I had to deal with post-traumatic stress disorder from that incident. Um, they have been involved in like three or four shootings within the last three or four years at this house, shooting at them or they shooting somebody. I don't know, they just shooting at the house. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people in the community that they're concerned, but I'm choosing to be, to be the voice of my community today. So I'm asking that someone uh, choose to say to, to help us say enough is enough with this house. It's been going on for like five or six years. And um, we're very concerned about our safety in our community right now. Very concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Can I ask that someone can follow up on this? Yeah, we'll get right on top of that, that and we'll have a sense of urgency. So thank you for bringing that forward. And sorry that you had to endure this for this long, some five years. It's way too long to endure this. So we'll have uh, Chief McDermott again, get some resources over there and take care of this right away. Charlene Beasley. If you can press star six to unmute. Hello, uh, yes. this is Charlene Beasley. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm representing 76 in Greenwood. We're located across the street from a church called New Life that seats 3000. This makes parking requirements and violations very sizable. We've been meeting with the church since February, following the instructions of CAPS and the Alderman's office and the advice of our DCO and various uh, patrol officers. We've used cones to block our permit parking spaces and place residential permit parking only signs on our fences to supplement the city signs. Nothing has worked to mitigate parking violations. Part of the church's new management plan includes being on one accord with the blocking community Regarding parking enforcement, they have included an initiative uh, calling for the calling of police uh, to have cars that violate parking laws ticketed and towed if necessary. We followed, we fo uh, forwarded the plan to Captain the Alderman's office. We're asking that there be consistent parking enforcement so that actions taken by the church and the community regarding parking is successful. Um, to date, it's been rare. We've endured such things as blocked alleys, not being able to go to work, seniors not going to their church because they're afraid that they're not gonna have a parking space when they come home. Our oldest residents are 92 and 86. Residents are staying home on Sundays to accumulate so, uh, calls of service, hoping police officers will ticket. Congregants and, and church attendees throw our cones on the grass and park in our spaces. Uh, they're parking in the no parking zones at intersections, causing blind spots and difficulties turning from Greenwood onto 76th and 79th Street. They're parking on crosswalks, affecting the safety of pedestrians and hindering those in wheelchairs. Double parking, hindering the movement of traffic and blocking cars in. And parking on fire hydrants, creating the potential for safety issues. We're asking for help so that the church and the community can succeed in parking management because the church is so loud so large it's three thousand feet thank you thank you um i i i'm, I'm not asking this question for the for the sake of, of of saying that you haven't done this but has community members tried to have conversations with the pastor and and tried to see if there's an opportunity maybe for the church members to park at the local park or the local school or something like that uh, we've been talking to uh, various leaders in the church since February. Okay. 
and right. nothing has worked. They have fought, they have five parking lots. Okay. And for some reason, sometimes the parking parking lots aren't full. People just don't want to park there. All right. So superintendent, I'll hand it over to you. I, I mean, yeah, yeah I we, I'm we sure we're apprehensive for riding and towing church members' cars. We need to come up with some kind of shuttle service solution to where maybe there's some off-site parking nearby. Let, let us explore this and, and try to negotiate some way to mitigate all the challenges in the neighborhood. Uh, I'm sure our officers are not excited about having to tow uh, our site church member car. So maybe the offsite shuttle service solution is viable. We'll work on it. Thank you. Next speaker, Bridget Faust. You can press star six to unmute. Bridget Faust. Next speaker, Leonette C. Hardy. Hello. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you today for uh, allowing me to speak on this panel. And uh, being a excuse me, <clears throat> being a uh, former twenty one year employee of 311, non-emergency police. I uh, really appreciate this this opportunity, but uh, I'm on here for two different, two reasons. Uh, as Ms. Beasley said, parking is very bad. And yes, we have talked to pastor about it. And at one time the pastor was paying people's tickets if they were parked illegally on the wrong side of the street. And it seems like when we do call the police, they are afraid to give tickets. I was once told that because it was through the alderman that they weren't getting tickets. Well, I stood outside on Sundays and actually have stood there telling people, you cannot park here. You cannot park here. And when the police come, they just drive down the street. So I literally had to stop a police car and make him, with the threat of if he didn't do what he was supposed to do, give tickets. And this should not be. If they come out, they should be able, they should see that their residential parking and we would like them to be ticketed because they have no respect for our properties and where we live at. I'm sorry, I'm sitting outside. That is something that we really would like someone to uh, look into that they get out their cars and just don't just drive past and not give tickets. The next thing I like to talk about is 79th and College Grove, from College Grove to Drexel is ridiculous. I'm scared to drive, people are scared to drive towards 79th and College Grove. There's a gas station on 79th and Maryland where there's been several shootings, several killings, and these young guys still continue to hang out and they, can't sit on a bus stop. People can't, can't get on the bus because people are sitting, congregating, drinking on the bus stop every day. It's ridiculous on all four corners of 79th and College Grove. We have had the uh, police Lord. officers come out and do Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, your time is up. So, Superintendent, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. Perhaps you can, maybe even you and I, Let's go have a conversation with the pastor. You know, part of our role here at the at the yep. police board is to 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 try to be this middleman between the community members and CPD, and um, it's hard enough already. And 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 you know, perhaps there's another way of of getting some resolution. I, I understand from the residents' perspective, um, you know, and and there should be order. Um, writing tickets is, is going to probably make everybody's job harder to satisfy community members in one sense, and it'll it'll make other community members dissatisfied. And so maybe there's a, some conversations that we can have. Um, so so I'll volunteer to do that. Um, yeah, me and I'll, I'll be there. Yeah, let's settle something with the past. OK. All right. Now, 79th Street, that's a different story. That, I'm going to leave. We'll, that have, we'll handle that part. Yeah, we'll handle that part. Yeah, and uh, let's you and I figure out how we can meet with the pastor and come up with a Okay. A viable solution that everyone can uh, live with. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next speaker, Matt Brandon. Good evening, uh, President Foreman, Superintendent Brown, members of the board, Dana O'Malley. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm calling 
in December of this uh, December of last year, I suffered a major heart attack, and uh, through the grace of God, I'm better now. I've been out on the street with Jennifer Edwards and Operation Neighborhood Safety, and we've been out doing our thing with our police partners in three and six. So uh, thank God, God is good. But my call is relative to now I'm on medication, and uh, I have to get my medication as a former Chicago employee through CVS. And the problem with CVS is that CVS has have, has left the black neighborhood. And I take it as a personal affront that I have to pay them for my medication, a black man, when you leave our community. So I'm asking, Superintendent, I know this is a contract negotiation thing and negotiation with the, with the city. Uh, I'm asking you to look into that. You know, I would like to be able to get my prescriptions from uh, stores in our neighborhood. So I'm asking for your help with that. Uh, one other quick thing, uh, I'm also a beat facilitator here in the third district, and we need to have some kind of identification for beat facilitators because, you know, superintendent, we work with the police uh, district and we go into stores, we go talk to our neighbors, and we want to be able to show that we're associated with the police department because we get many times we get pushed back. Who are you? You're a beat facilitator. You know, we, we need to figure out something where we can show that we work closely with the district police and, and we are working in the best interests of our communities. Thank you for both of those and, and our deepest condolences to the officers who, uh, who lost their lives recently. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and we're happy that you're with us and hopefully you're getting your exercise and eating right. We need you here. We need you in the community. So uh, looking forward to to getting back in person and, and seeing you in person at these police board meetings. Thank uh, you, sir. Our next speaker, Eunice Chapman Regis. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm an active member of 79th FR Black Club, and our Marcos Plate continues to involve Family Fresh Market located at 457 East 79th Street, where there's been a long history of them being. A haven for drug sales and activities, sales of blue cigarettes, loitering allowed, even though no trespassing affidavit has been signed with the 6th District Police Station. So it's previously closed on several occasions due to shootings and health violations. Tonight there was a shooting while the IG was speaking. Um, the police responded quickly. Three apartment buildings, 440 East, 440 East 80th Street. Remains a haven for adult black men and women squatters, even though the building is boarded. I saw two men entering their location today. Prostitution occurs there. Police come, run the squatters out. They return after police leave. Police said they told the neighbors they can't make the squatters leave. The police have told the neighbors they can't leave, make the squatters leave. 443 East 80th Street has squatters, but these are young black males, 14 to 23 years stealing cars, hiding them behind the buildings, attacking passersby, drug sales and youth, storing a cache of gun weapons, handguns and semi-automatic rifles. They dress in all black tops and black pants and wear red baseball caps. I'm not sure what color their gym shoes. 7905, 7909, Eberhardt, multi-unit apartment building, loitering, selling drugs outside the building. These are men, and black men and women. They have crates they sit on and leave the crates there overnight, even though there's no trust loitering signs posted alongside this building. The custodian for the building is part of the league with them, and he doesn't make them leave. These people do not live in this area. Our quality and safety of life is compromised and threatened as many families with minor children live on 7900 block of Eberhardt and along East 80th Street. Please help us as we continue to share information with you to assist you as you serve and protect our community. Thank you and have a blessed evening. Thank you. Superintendent, is there a way we can coordinate with the Department of Buildings um, to take a look at some of these? Yes, we have a troubled buildings unit that, that collaborates with, with uh, the city department as well. So we, I have people taking notes on all the information we're getting from everyone. So we'll certainly follow up with. Thank you. Our next speaker, Donald Gross. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I'm Don Gross and I'm speaking on behalf of Justice for Anthony Alvarez. We just heard that the board believes that the proper punishment for murder is a 20 day suspension. This is an insult to the people of Chicago and every one of you who does not speak out against this decision should be ashamed. 
For over 175 days since the close of the COPA investigation into Anthony's murder, you all and David Brown kept killers on the force. Now you want to keep them on the force for decades. Today, a single one of you decided against the evidence clearly laid out by the civilian police, age, the civilian oversight agency, that Evan Solano, a murderer, gets to keep his job. The same Evan Solano who pulled his gun in a road rage incident not long after killing Anthony. Today's decision makes every single person in the city of Chicago less safe because they all know that CPD officers can get away with murder if they can get a police board member to buy their excuses. You should be ashamed. COPA saw the murder that Evan Solano committed and rightly recommended firing him. Even the Cook County State's attorney stated that Solano and his partner created the conditions that led to Anthony's death. Now, a hand-picked stooge of Mayor Lightfoot, Stephen Block, has, de- has blocked the smallest amount of justice that Anthony's family... I, 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 I'm, I'm gonna let you continue, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna do name calling, so I'm gonna let you continue but we're not gonna, we're not gonna do name calling. If you can press star six to unmute. So I was just saying an appointee of Mayor Lightfoot who just joined the board this year has blocked the smallest amount of justice that Anthony's family could have gotten from you. Stephen Block, I have no idea why you made this decision. We will not stop demanding justice for Anthony and all victims of the Chicago Police Department. All right, Mr. Gross, I'm going to I'm going to encourage you to read the decision. It'll be posted on our board's website. Um, I encourage everyone to read the COPA decision. OK, um, I don't remember if I called Linda Hudson. Linda Hudson. I'm here. I'm here. Hi, good evening. My name is Linda Hudson and um, I live in Avalon Park. It seems like Avalon Park is in the house tonight. I have complained to the board before about a neighbor who used to work um, and do the fireworks for Navy Pier. Uh, For the past four years, this man has done the same Navy Pier type fireworks on this residential block where our homes are extremely close together. We have asked him and begged him, please don't do your fireworks. After joining Citizens for Safer Celebrations, it was suggested that I contact (laughs) my DCO ahead of the July 4th holiday, realizing that our officers are busy on most holidays. I reached out to DCO officer Ali Abdul weeks before July 4th. Officer Abdul assured me that he would have a talk with this neighbor. I even received a call from Glenn Brooks assuring me of the same. On July 4th, around seven o'clock, the explosive started. There were 10 to 15 people blocking the street and sidewalk. They put landscape blocks in the middle of the street. They even started a fire in the middle of the street. Um, The noise was absolutely horrendous and it shook windows. It upset our pets. All the neighbors came out. We begged him to stop. There were underage children participating in these illegal activities. I called Officer Abdul, left a message. I spoke to Glenn Brooks, who was able to speak to him, and he sent officers out. The officers, um, they did not ask for any information from these 10 to 15 people, no ISR, no administrative notice of violation, and of course there was no arrest. They talked to the group and one of the officers said, Ms. Hudson, he said he will stop. After the officers left, my neighbor shouted, and I quote, fuck the police, and he continued with the explosives. Officer Abdul returned my call on July 7th and apologized for dropping the ball. July 4th is a busy time, Ms. Hudson. I know July 4th is a busy time, which is why I was proactive and I reached out to him ahead of time. Um, Mm -hmm. This man has no respect for his neighbors, for the police, for the law. I recently participated in coffee with the commander and I reported this to 4th District Commander Milmar. You say that you want to work with the community. You say that uh, if you see something, say something. I'm the community. I see something. I'm saying something. Is it going to have to take someone's house burning down, someone losing a limb? What do you suggest we do as a block club, as a community? Because we are at a loss. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Superintendent? Ma'am, you've done your part. We dropped the ball. We need to get pick the ball back up and take care of this for you. We'll certainly follow up with you. 
and make sure that gets done. Thank you. Our final speaker, Mr. Robert Moore. Mr. Moore, if you could press star six on one of the phones. Hello, Mr. Foreman, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm hitting a uh, uh, minute 59 here. I got an outline posted because I'm not going to get through. There's so much material here that I'm trying to get into the public record to get to, above all, posterity and to whatever extent there's any innocence or regeneracy still left in the population. And beyond that, the other than incorrigible component of the population, because there's a certain component of the population that isn't vicious. There's no animus. There's no ill will. It's just that they're in a state of faint heartedness and they're not using the retardants that Providence has provided for faint heartedness. But at any rate, what this, so this is going to be posted in an outline. I'm trying to do as much as I can, but I've got a huge long list here of items and I'm down to a minute. I'm down to 80 seconds already. The answer to all this is vigilanteism vindications, at least until control, the now nominal nation, which has been taken over by the committee, the 300, it would have been recovered from the global plantation overlord genocidus. We need vigilanteism. That's the answer, not being dependent upon some entity that's ultimately controlled by the individuals at the top, which is the Committee of 300, whose agenda is the reduction of population to getting rid of at least 90, 95% of the non-Jews presently on the face of the earth. There's nothing that's anti-Semitic about that. I mean, there's, there is no one who's more contra-anti-Semitic than Robert J. Moore. Facts are facts. Ben Friedman, 1961. He understood the product of the learning elder Zion because it was read at his dinner table when he was growing up, but all the guys who ended up in the cabin under Franklin Roosevelt. Facts are facts, okay? Ben Friedman warns America. Next issue. I'm so sorry, as much as I'm in a position of opposition with the city of Chicago Police Department, because there's an instrument that ultimately is controlled through whatever intermediary by these individuals at the top, is that the individual members of CPD, please don't commit suicide. I understand there's no people in position of authority over you who are trying to keep God's commandments. You're in between a rock and a hard place. But don't commit suicide. Call me, 773-996-3218. And give me an opportunity to explain a reason for you to go on. Please don't commit suicide. It doesn't accomplish anything. It only brings you into an eternity of misery. You still have the opportunity to salvage it. Where there's life, there's hope. So please, just to get, there's no justification for committing, committing suicide, and there's ways to get through this difficulty and hardship, as distressing a period in history as it is. So we can provide you formulas. It's only one three-second period at a time. That's all human beings are subjected to. That That's the length of time within which a human act can be executed. So you, don't Mr. take Moore. your own life. I, am I, Mr. Foreman, are you, am I still cut off, or did I already get cut off? No, no, no. It, 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 it's time, but I think that you 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 ended us on a very good note, and and I would really I would I agree and, and concur with your message. Um, yeah, I just want to get that out because the point is I've been where these people are, and it, it's not hopeless. There's I can give you dot to dot to dot where everything's broken down to small enough steps, and then you just need to be accountable to someone, and you need to have contact, and you have to get rid of. The I'm sorry, Mr. Moore, I, you know, normally I'm quick on the mute button, but but I, I really appreciate your message today. And, and superintendent, you know, on behalf of the police board, we concur with Mr. Moore wholly. Uh, you know, we want to ensure that your officers, um, you know, that they can get the assistance they need. We, we know that they have a hard job. We appreciate the police. Um, and it's not always easy for community members, but, you know, uh, ultimately, uh, we know that it's the police that they, they have a job to try to help our communities. And so we want to support the police. We don't want, we want to see them healthy and we want their families to know that, that, um, you know, that we also support them. And so at this moment in time, all members of the public who signed up to speak have been called. Is there a motion to adjourn? Don't move, Paul Wolf. Second, Michael Eady. All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Be safe. Thank you. Good night.